All right, Greg. I think that's. Uh, I think that we're ready to go, and it's it's uh, uh, live on on LinkedIn. So we'll go ahead and get started. So uh, some of you might just be popping in, or if you pop in a couple minutes late, that's fine. Um, so thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, what we're going to be going over today is a collaboration between two companies, Arcadia Cognorati and Milo. Milo specifically, the cognitive division of Milo, and we're going to be talking about our new series uh, called the Hoberman series uh, that we're going to be showing for you today and explaining our approach to how we do this type of training. So real quick, I'm Brian Marin. I'm the Senior VP of Operations for Arcadia Cognorati. We're a, a training and consulting firm who are experts in what we call human behavior pattern recognition and analysis. Um, so we do human behavior, the limits of human performance, and we're experts in setting up uh, a realistic uh, type training events. So uh, that's a little bit about us. And also on the call, we have Greg, uh, Greg Williams. He's the president and founder of Arcadia Cognorati, and he is the creator of human behavior pattern recognition and analysis, which is uh, we're going to talk a little bit about today and how we put that in a video-based simulator. Greg uh, is an architect of Marine Corps Combat Hunter Program, the U.S. Army's Advanced Situational Awareness Training, um, um, several other uh, government programs of record, um, and you likely either maybe some of you have been on here before, been to some of our in-person training, or seen us on LinkedIn, you'll get a little bit more of what we do, or, or heard us on our Left of Greg podcast, but that's who's going to be on the call. We are also joined by Joe Kehoe, or Lawrence Kehoe is his official name, you know him by Joe. Uh, he'll be hopping on to towards the end to help out with some of the Q&A. So we're going to jump into this. It's going to be us on transmit for a little while, and then we're going to have uh, some opportunities to discuss any questions that are asked uh, at the end. But feel free uh, during the webinar to go ahead and throw in some some questions in the chat or any comments in there. Uh, there will be some folks from Milo, Milo who can answer some of the specific questions during it, but feel free to put it in there. Just know that we're likely not going to get to it until the end. And this is also being recorded, which you should get an email uh, with a link to that to, to watch it uh, later on if you can't get through all of it today, or if you'd like to pass that around to other folks who are interested in seeing it. So as we all know, Zoom, it's not the same as being in the same room. So we're not going to try to do the same things we would do if we were doing in-person training. But it's important to understand that because no matter how sophisticated the technology, remote platforms simply can't match the few, real feel of physical interactions. Human connection of face-to-face -face engagement promotes more meaningful communication. We thought it was appropriate to address that right up front because we're talking about video-based training and those type of solutions. And so we want to make sure that there are things that can be done and can be done really well in a format like this. Is it as good as in-person training? Uh, it's not quite the same thing. So we're going to stick to what we can accomplish. But uh, if after this you are interested in some of our in-person training, uh, we are going to be collaborating with Milo as well to offer a more in-depth version of what you're getting today. Obviously, today is just a webinar. It's information-based. And and uh, and so you know we want to stick to that. And I'm getting a text. I want to make sure that the, the chat function uh is is working because it sounds like it's not so i can do something for that real quick and see if i can fix that but you know what tell you what i'm gonna go ahead and get started greg and then i'll work on that maybe uh in, in a second here once once you pick up if that works that sounds great okay so we'll go ahead and jump in. So first of all, why did we choose to partner with Milo? Well, we're, we have the same uh, approach to a lot of things that we do. So Milo is specifically their cognitive division is looking at different types of video-based training systems and all the different systems that Milo has. They're an established company. They've been around for a long time. They've been in the game for a while. They have a parent company that's done a ton of work too uh, with the military and, and a whole bunch of other different folks, not just within military and law enforcement, but private sector as well. And then so what we thought we could do with our uh, longstanding programs that have proven uh, effective over time is we could sort of put something together and kind of create some new uh, way of looking at training and new way of doing things. So that's why we came up with the Hoberman series. So it's a training advantage uh, that we bring to the table uh, with coupled with Milo's sort of state of the art immersive training environments that they can build. The idea is to allow officers to smoothly transition among a number of challenging, relevant, real-life uh, decisions 
right? Including use of force options, de-escalation, and fitting within the tactical, operational, and strategic objectives of their specific agency. And Milo stands for the multiple interactive learning objectives, which is what we do. So we 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 like their name, and uh, we think they're an amazing company. And they've got cognitive in their cognitive vision. We've got Cognorati in ours. So it, it seemed like a, a great fit. And in our scenarios uh, that we're going to be talking about today. All right. Officers are presented with a diverse range of cognitively challenging environments where they can require to interact their sense making problem problem solving, uh, uh, develop advanced critical thinking skills, make good decisions and understanding fully why those decisions were made. So the idea is we sort of took the, the you know, Milo's peanut butter and our chocolate and we put it together and we have create this advantage that of an evidence based advanced learning arena with custom built content and curriculum. So, Brian, the, the simple thing to understand is we're not going to be able to arrest our way out of this situation. Uh, the problems that we're in, you can't just put up science to fix what's broke. So with proper cognitive training, we can learn to think our way out and, and reason our way out. So what I like to, to think about when I see that is that, you know, when we think about how education works, we educate for certainty. We don't do that. We train. We train for the uncertainty. We allow your brain to understand the possibilities from any situation and train to a standard so you can use those to pay forward to the next novel circumstance that you might run into. So slide, please. Uh, what's one of the first most important lessons that we're trying to infuse into our joint effort with Milo? Well, we call it the people teach you how they want to be treated. Well, further, the corollary is true. The, through your actions and statements, you teach them how you want to be treated. And if there's a disconnect, there can be a problem. And this is where case law comes from. Slide, please. And I want you to imagine a, a, a radio transmitting on one frequency, but you're tuned to another frequency. And that makes it so we don't see things as they truly are. Slide, please. We see things as we are. And I want to give you an example of that over the next couple of slides. So if we can go to slide 16 for a second. One of our students, <clears throat> a trained experienced veteran, was daydreaming at a traffic light and he caught himself and remembered a lesson that we taught in class about focus and he started to assess the vehicles and the drivers around him and that's when he noted a driver in the curb lane far to his right was distraught and crying and he did a quick assessment of them and their car and among other things noted that the little man indicating the father and the little stick family on the display on the rear uh, had been freshly scratched off so he put this together with an explanatory storyline that said, hey, perhaps the woman may have recently broke up with her significant other and was having a depressed moment and probably shouldn't be driving. Just then the light turned green and she accelerated quickly, cutting across all lanes of traffic to make an unannounced left and almost T-bone in his car. You're going to ask, so what? So what? That's analysis paralysis. You have the evidence, it all adds up and you still do nothing. Knowing how to look but not making a decision can be just as dangerous as missing the signals. Let's go on to the next slide, Brian. And, and the next photo refers to a real life incident that happened only last year in Rhode Island. Some of the most important and well-trained shark scientists got together for a study, a shark study, remember that. While tuning up their equipment in a boat on the way to the X, the researchers noticed a, a, a 50 foot representation of a prehistoric megalodon on their equipment. Extinct, yet there it is. So they're frightened, they're a little bit confused, and mere seconds later, the 50-foot megalodon dissipates, and what's left is a 50-foot school of mackerel. So what? No matter how well-trained you are, your brain can accidentally hijack you and try to force a round pair, uh, peg into a square hole. So under novel circumstances or extraordinary external arousal, you could be victim to this just as well. Here, they're geniuses in the field, inclined to believe that a prehistoric megalodon had resurfaced because they were presupposed, they were biased to see sharks. They interpreted that information based on the existing notion or an implanted notion, think about like dispatch calling out your, your next call, rather than seeing what was truly in front of them and, and treating it that way. And then Brian on slide 18, <clears throat> this photo, another a real event uh, that's occurring. We're just using the photo for non-attribution. It's midnight shift, seasoned veteran sergeant in a very big city, steps out of the police station lobby to take a private phone call. So as he's standing in front of the steps, chatting on his phone, a car pulls up, driver exit, keeping the driver door open, the engine's running, and waves the cop over frantically. And the sergeant doesn't move, but holds his finger up and kind of orients away, you know, that universal sign for wait, I'm busy. 
the driver begins honking impatiently and the, the detective's getting angrier and he's wondering, hey, why isn't this guy just noticing that I'm on the phone? Keeps waving that one finger. And finally, the sergeant gets pissed enough that he walks over to see what the hubbub is. And the driver says, hey, I just killed my entire family. In fact, a loaded gun that I used is on the seat right next to me. So I want to confess you and turn myself in. Holy crap. These are three true things that happen to illustrate what? Uh, the so what here is the trained seasoned vet didn't sense make the most likely course of action and the most dangerous course of action of the situation that was developing around him. And he could have easily become a victim. Slide, please. So, Brian, <clears throat> my perceptions are exactly that. They're mine. It's all about me. I make the mistake of carrying my perspectives and biases into every situation, every human encounter. I, I wear them like my uniform. So there's certain psychological imperatives that blind me to the things that are happening right around me, the sights, sounds, feeling, the clues, the cues, the evidence that's coalescing, that something might be going sideways fast. So what I have to understand, and I have to understand it first and fast, is that I've either got to work to change me or work to change you. And which do you think is going to be the easiest? So cognitive skill mastery requires patience, rehearsal, and repeated perfect practice, all of which that our in-person training and Milo's wonderful uh, uh, scenario-based training can accomplish. Meaningful change doesn't require a radical change. So this works in your pre-existing Milo situations right now. Slide, please. So one of the issues that we've seen over the years and my um, experience in, in modeling and simulation, training and simulation, and what the forefront of those technologies were dates back to about 2007, 2008, when I had you know, first kind of view of that in some major government projects, which actually where I first initially ran into Greg when he was implementing the Combat Hunter program in the Marine Corps. But what happens is the focus is overwhelmingly on the technology at the expense of other aspects of training design. The primary interest is in the sheer power of the technology, the graphics, the visual realism. But the needs of the trainee, which should be the focal point of the entire effort, seem to have become an afterthought. Now, I, I want to be clear, it's important to continue to understand or, or continue to update and uh, improve the technology and make it more real and have more fidelity and better refresh rate and smaller batteries and batteries that last longer. That's all important. And Milo does a great job of consistently updating what they do. But the focus is on achieving physical fidelity. Training designers focus on capturing the physical reality of the environment to make it appear as real as possible to the visual, auditory, and tactile senses. Physical fidelity is something that advanced technology does very well. Higher physical fidelity is largely a function of capturing the, physical, uh, the visible world in, in ever greater levels of detail. Cognitive fidelity, however, is not achievable through the brute application of computing power and high-definition graphics. It depends on a deeper understanding of cognitive requirements of how humans perform under conditions of uncertainty, uh, time pressure, and other stresses. So sometimes they go too much fidelity. So we don't worry about that. We choose what's close enough. And creative cognitive fidelity requires a meaningful front-end analysis, produces true insight into the training challenge. It rests on clarity, con uh, conciseness, and elegance of design. And you can even go back years, and, and even within law enforcement, the studies have been shown to, that concluded that blended training, so emphasizing the use of both in-person and simulator, produces the best training outcomes. And by training outcomes, I mean not how well you did in the training, I mean the effectiveness on the street, the performance in the field of how you actually operate. And training technologies allow for that situational training that can't safely be done in a real setting, not unlike a flight simulator, right? An, a, a pilot has to have a certain amount of hours simulating what they're likely going to do. The problem is becoming more dependent on technology can erode basic cognitive skills. We've seen even recently with plane crashes where they found out it, it, they had all the times, they had all the requirements, they made uh, their, their amount of hours in the simulators, and they made some basic fundamental errors on how to actually fly the plane because the focus had changed from flying the plane to operating a specific system. So what we go with is cognitively close enough. And I'm sure some of you have had this experience before. Uh, I've felt I've fell into this trap years ago where a scenario desire, designer or training officer kind of wants to put an officer into a potentially fatal encounter with a hidden jack-in-the-box moment. All of a sudden, surprise, is it a gun or is it a cell phone? Right. And, and some uh, trainers go as far as trying to equate the exact things a police officer will see or experience. Well, it turns out neither of those things are essential to meaningful cognitive training. I have to engage my decision making process within that to understand and make better decisions 
out on the road. Yeah, and, and we're going we're gonna to break that down. We're not in a hurry here. <clears throat> we're going to give you an idea of what cognitive training means and how it can advance your critical thinking. And what Brian was talking about, I'll street it up for you real quick. If you increase your cognitive load <clears throat> without increasing your cognitive training, you're headed for a fall. And, and that's when things like uh, reaching for your uh, uh, taser and actually grabbing your gun occur. And we could go into that on future episodes. But why did we choose Hoberman? What, what was the idea behind it? Well, here's the thing. Hoberman is all about critical thinking. And Hoberman is all about a little plastic toy that you might have played with when you were a kid. It's a Hoberman sphere. And at this size, about as big as my head, right? The idea is I want to be able to take any complex problem and I want to break it down into its essentials and be able to see it in 360. But not just here. I want to be able to take it over there. And I want to be able to apply it to my next problem, too, and keep it in the car in case the kids have a problem. So Hoberman was easy, the, 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 the name of Hoberman. And slide, please. So let's, let's see what the next part of the creative process was. Well, I don't agree with Ben and Jerry's politics all the time, but I certainly agree with their ice cream evidence, right? But the idea was that when Ben and Jerry were asked, how did you get all these killer flavors of ice cream that people just salivate over all the time? They said, you got to start with vanilla. So the lowest common denominator in the situation has to be the good basics, Brian, that architecture, which we build on. So folks, if you're listening at home and you're seeing that Ben and Jerry and you're too salivating, think you can't get to the peanut butter and the, you know, uh, uh, Rocky Garcia and all the other fancy flavors without building that cherry Garcia, I guess it would be without building that vanilla slide. And then I think I ate too much Ben and Jerry's because back when I was a kid, Brian, I was always in the dentist's office and, and there was those magazines around. I read every one of them cover to cover while I was waiting. And there were these characters, Goofus and Gallant. And, and even now I, I added the one on the right so people could see they're still in the same dentist's office. I had a photo from the one at my local dentist. Brian, the idea was how do you model behavior? And the idea about behavior modeling is huge because part of cognition is I have to learn. I have to have one, uh, accelerated learning for a very diverse environment. I also have to have two, it has to mimic realism, but only cognitive realism to the point of decision-making, sense-making, problem-solving, decision-making. So the idea is that I wanted to use something and the goofus and gallant, uh, gallant element becomes Hoberman. And then finally, slide, Brian, if you take a look, uh, uh, I'm old enough to remember, and maybe some of the trainers on the call are as well, Dave Smith. Uh, uh, first met Dave Smith down in Ohio at the Apple Pit, probably in uh, 1979 or 1980. And he started a character, Brian, for the law enforcement uh, network, uh, the television network, LETN, that was called J.D. Buck Savage. And if you remember him, what he would do, Brian, he was the goofs and gallant. He would model that behavior so I could learn from his mistakes before I made those mistakes on the road. So all of those things came together to say, look, we need a safe place for longitudinal practice that I can go in and practice my brain training over and over in a safe environment until I get it right. And, and I can do that with a team or I can do that with trainers. And you know what we call that slide? We call that the cognitive gym. And we've called it the cognitive gym for a long, long time. So if you're a trainer and you're sitting there listening to my voice, would you ask yourself this question? Does your team, the team around you right now, know what to do when they don't know what to do? Brian, that's true cognitive training right there. Training means aligning your team's values and visions with their behavior. And, and what we're offering today and what we're offering with Milo isn't a, a thing. It's a think. We want you to be able to think through hard but solvable problems. So what we're offering is a low calorie, high payoff intervention so that you can intervene sooner, mitigate the situation sooner, and change the outcomes for the better. Slide, please. So we, we set out to break the mold. And Milo Cognitive, coupled with AC, gives your agency a comprehensive, in-person, video-based training program that addresses the complex conditions that your officers face while targeting reality-based, relevant training objectives with an applied scientific solution. Slide, please. So Hoberman series creates a new standard, a new standard in cognitive training and decision-making, decision-making in extremis, as, as, as it's known as. And I know you're thinking, well, not every, you know, encounter that a police officer has is life or death, and, but it, which is true, but, but every single encounter has the potential to be. That's what makes it unique. And there are certain limiting factors all humans have in those situations. And if I'm not training within those limiting factors, I'm likely to make a mistake. Well, we don't want to do that. So we created the Hoberman series, right? And the idea is, is 
cognition means thinking, right? The mental process of acquiring knowledge, understanding uh, through thought, experience, your senses. And metacognition literally means thinking about thinking. So the knowledge and regulation of your own cognitive process. This is a critical component of creative thinking. And then we can create advanced critical thinking. So true cognitive training means addressing the acquisition, storage, interpretation, manipulation, transformation, and use of specific, specific knowledge. The idea is I can think my way into or think my way out of any problem that I'm likely to face. But I have to do that by setting up the training correctly. So starting with basic ELOs, enabling learning objectives, right? So the Hoberman trains people to use their senses in highest performance limits. That's what I said, in extremis, so that they can take in, store, and retrieve that specific information relative to the increasing demands of their profession. Uh, meaning I can learn here in the simulator, and as long as something uh, is, is it's close enough to something I'm likely to see in the future, well, I, I can access that. I can learn from that. And so by putting this together, our HBP RNA and our human behavior based uh, programs with Milo, right, we creates that advanced critical thinking mindset. So what this series does is create advanced critical thinking skills. Once you have the skills, right, I can go out and practice that. Then I develop that mindset to where it's like an operating system that's running in the background the entire time without me even realizing it. And, and we have to create essential terminal learning objectives out of the Hoberman series. So this is the examples of some of the terminal learning objectives uh, that we've been able to in infuse into this process. So the Hoberman training is going to reduce the reaction of surprise, fear, and panic, and allow uh, users to make critical decisions using available information and constraints. Greg something that the said something at the beginning that was extremely important. He said, sense make and problem solve. It's what you go through your whole life doing, right? But if all of our training takes place at, hey, when you're scared or when you're surprised or when these things happen, this is how we'll operate. Well, well, what if we focus on not getting to that level? What if we focus on understanding the situation better so I, I, I don't become overwhelmed with physiological and psychological arousal and limit my, my options? So it provides decision-making methodology with an embedded process for articulating artifacts and evidence relevant to making the best decision. It allows the ability to perceive evolving threats or opportunities sooner so I can intervene before a situation escalates and allows your personnel to use an evidence-based approach during training, during the real event, which will then subsequently help with report writing and, 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 and court testimony. So I'm able to identify and mitigate harmful or unhelpful biases, both explicit and implicit, towards the people I encounter. And the idea is to develop positive, helpful biases, both explicit and implicit, towards other people. So the Hoberman series is, is uh, like I said, it's a series, and we're going to be talking about the first episode that's released and available to all of you uh, today. If you have a Milo system, you can get this uh, first episode. And what they do is, is they place law enforcement officers in tough but solvable situations to increase critical thinking skills. Um, they're going to help them make the right legal, moral, and ethical decisions before a situation escalates. But the idea about Hoberman isn't just one person. It's not just uh, 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 this, this officer in this first scenario. Hoberman literally represents any of us. It could be any one of us in this situation and it represents all of us. So it doesn't matter what your background is or where you're from or who you are or what God you pray to or choose not to pray to, right? It's the idea, it's, it's, it's human behavior at a fundamental level that is seen no matter where you're at in the world, no matter what you're doing. And it's not intended to replace anything. So it's not replacing all the great scenarios that Milo already has anything that you've built for. The idea, it's just different, right? It's it's an addition onto it so I can improve my cognitive acumen. I can increase those skills to to in, in critical thinking in those extreme situations. So the first one, the cut and run, is not a typical shoot, don't shoot training scenario, right? It's designed for you to think your way through a novel situation and it compels you to utilize all of the resources you would have available if you were in that situation in real life. So I, I, I don't just rely on what this one scenario is. It's what does my specific agency have uh, when I'm out on the road? Uh, what is my role? That's going to change from one shift to another. But you are allowed to use all of that within these scenarios. And, and the first one, uh, we call it uh, cut and run. And cut and run, it's kind of a play on words. It's an old street expression that, uh, uh, you know, some police officers use when they discovered that 
reasonable, reasonable suspicion had dissipated, uh, don't have probable cause, and now it's time to let these people go. It's time to cut and run. And then the second you know, meaning behind it is sort of becomes apparent in the scenario. So the, tenture, the tension in the scenario can increase to a point right, where someone involved in that scenario might choose to, you know, I'm not sticking around here any longer. I'm going to cut and run. So the beauty of this series is that you as an instructor, you as the trainer can choose to ramp up or dial down the intensity level of the scenario based on the experience level of the trainee by adding or removing additional discussions, by, by not hitting on certain things or, or making sure we bring this up, bring up uh, other elements or, or right there in the middle of the scenario to go, hey, I know you signed the, uh, the new memorandum that went around from the chief, but did you read it? Because it applies right here in this situation. And what does he mean by that? And all of these interaction opportunities and critical decision points are built into the scenario. So you don't have to come up with them on your own. You have to say, all right, stop right here. I want to discuss something. We build that in for you, right? And each one is, is a, a potential interaction opportunity. We, we've added discussion points. And those discussion points directly relate to the specific prompts within that Hoberman scenario. And what we did was we built an entire guidebook to help you along with this. So the beauty of the guidebook, it's your instruction manual. It's those uh, uh, guided discussions, and they're general enough right, to, to uh, pertain to any law enforcement agency, no matter how big or how small they are, uh, no matter how many authors you have, right? And, and, but they they're allow you to take and tailor it to your specific agency. So now you can go and well, what does that mean for our policies and procedures? Oh, but wait a minute. If you're interacting with the adjacent agency, uh, the town down the road, because you're the uh, county sheriff's office, well, well, they have a little bit different policies and procedures. So how would they handle that? And then, then how would we interact with that? You can have all of those discussions in a controlled environment. And we break some of those decision points down into different buckets, right? So there's there's legal, moral, and ethical considerations. Um, there's tactical, operational, and strategic considerations. And then there's human, be human behavior and human performance considerations right, that I can take into account not just of myself, but of the people in the scenario. So now I can learn how to articulate what it is that I'm seeing within this controlled environment. And then each question in those guidebooks, it's designed specifically to elicit training responses on a cognitive level. What would you do now? Why would you do that? How does that policy fit in to our overall objective here? So again, we're empowering the training officer, the, the people who, who should be uh, conducting this training. Uh, it allows you to adapt it and modify it and, and influence their behavior at that, at that tactical level right there at your agency to have better training outcomes. So those responses, uh, you know, the likely range of responses from the trainees are allowed so that you as a trainer can use them to determine the proficiency level of each trainee. Because that might vary from one person to the next. Uh, uh, some officers are better in some areas. Some uh, are better in others. And we have to, I can, I can see how they handle the situation in real time. And even within the guidebook, it comes down to very simple instruction manual. Okay, here's how you do it. Here's how you set it up. Here's the brief you're going to give to that officer before they go in. Here are the things that you have available. Now I have my discussion points. So the idea is it's, it's for you to have a framework Right, that's sound, that's vetted, that's scientifically vetted, legal, moral, and ethical, but but that you can influence, so you can adapt it and modify it to make it personal to you and your agency. And Brian, could we go back to that last slide for just a second? But I'd like to add to it, folks. Right now, you're thinking, "Wow, did I tune into the right discussion?" Yeah, you're at the right place. If you're a trainer, if you're an officer, if you're interested, if you're the check writer for your agency or the DA, doesn't matter. We're trying to speak to all those levels, and you're thinking, "Man, some of these concepts might be out of my pay grade." Don't worry about that. We're going we're gonna to show you in detail why it's not. And for example, the Homer guidebook uh, says when to warm it up, how to turn it on, do all those things. So all those questions are answered for you. And Brian, most likely the reason that the people are on the call today, one of two things. They're interested in Hoberman and have never seen it, or they've seen it and never cracked the guidebook open. So they've been doing it the old way the entire time, and they haven't availed themselves of all the magic that's there for them. Slide, please. So listen. The guidebook includes stuff like actions outside the scenario. You know what that means? That means you talking in the hallway before you're ever going to walk in and do the scenario. And this is a, a discussion, and, and it's word for word. Listen, say these things. This is the likely response you'll get. Then do these things. And it's designed so whether you're at a, you know, there's 15,000, 18,000 agencies in the United States alone. So whether you're in a big agency or you don't have a SWAT team, whether you're an adjunct or adding on, a, you know, as a task force, you're going to be able to use these and personalize them for your agency. Slide, please.
families. So all of those considerations that you have to do before you get there, additionally, the gear, the weapons, those things, they're all broken down for you. So you can actually read them, Brian. And there's a quick start to go back and show you, hey, remember how we do these slides. And, and I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. Here's our, our, our good buddy, Joe. And you can see that Hoberman's in the background and it's actually the pre-stage, right? So what are you seeing? Well, you're seeing a drone view, slide place. So in the guidebook, corresponding to that actual slide says number two there, it's highlighted, a drone view of the potential incident location based on the you know, grid coordinates and all those other things. And you're wondering, okay, so why go into this level of detail, slide place? Well, I'll show you why. The little orange block that you're seeing right there indicates where this uh, uh, Hoberman officer is out uh, uh, with these other subjects. Now, have you considered before you arrive doing the map recon to determine the, the direction that you wanna drive uh, because it's low light or no light, are they gonna see your headlights or hear your big block engine come up? Uh, uh, Brian, have you considered slide please? Uh, it's something that there's a water feature right next to this closed building. And what if somebody does flee or try to run from you? Uh, the whole group does. And now all of a sudden they're in the water. Have you considered slide please? Uh, uh, having a rescue unit or a boat or a canoe, or is there a farm down the road that you could grab one from? Is Air East up? Is somebody on a, a, the, the big light there that can help you find a drowning victim? Brian, if you don't, you could be in the trick bag on this. So slide. What about on the way there that you uh, figure out there's a major road that's to the east of the situation. And what if the subject runs across the street that way and gets predorked by a car? These are all things that happen and they raise and change the intensity and the complexity level. And there's things that you could do before you ever respond to the call. Now there's some calls where there is a temporal element or a time element. This isn't one of them, Brian. This is one to help you think through cognitive slide. I'll give you an example. If you take a look, there's uh, in the hex, uh, hexagonal thing on the left of the lake there, there's a four-story parking garage that's that's right on scene here that you can see on the map view, you can see in the game. Uh, the idea is, let's say that you have a thermal or, or an NVG or a, just a pair of street binos that you use sometimes for hunting and sometimes on the road. You maybe send a unit there or you could respond there yourself in your smaller unit and take a look at the actors in play, a fly on the wall. That's conducting an experiment before you call out at the scene. Maybe that's the way that you want to take it. So myriad options, Brian, all available in the scenario. Slide, please. And, and the idea is that if you look close enough at your map, you'll see there's a little pedestrian bridge that connects both sides of that. So you can actually park on one, walk across the water and influence the direction that the people are oriented. All of these things are built in, not only in your guidebook, but to the scenario to make it easy for you. So Brian, you can spend five minutes at on-duty roll call doing training, or you can spend 45 minutes running through an entire scenario with the team. Slide, please. So one of the conditions uh, uh, that we set up for is no matter how big or small your agency is or what you have available, the gear list is optimizable for your use. So absolutely anything that you want to do, whether, whether it's a fire blanket or a fire extinguisher or whether it's a doll for the kids in a traumatic incident, you can custom it, Brian, to what your agency has and the strategic vision of your leaders. That's magic. Slide, please. And so now we're going to call out at the scene, Brian. So what are those actions just before I arrive at the scene? What are those things I'm looking for? And when my foot hits the ground, am I notifying dispatch that I'm out? Uh, when I exit the vehicle, am I doing it to a covered position? Those considerations are in there again. And you could break it up. You could do a series for four days at on-duty roll call of all these pre-event and at-bang incidents, and then discuss it later when you're in the game on that Friday afternoon shift. It's infinitely customizable slide. And what I mean by that, Brian, is we offer the task condition and standards. So what does that mean? Well, we're showing you specifically and deliberately that we designed this scenario with these thought points, and this is how you, how you win, how you achieve a win, let's call it, in a situation. But along the way, Brian, there's a series of obstacles and things that you have to overcome. And guess what? They're tough, but they're solvable, but they're not shooting based and they're not uh, based on speed uh, or elegance. And, and you know what? We didn't just complicate it by adding actors to the scenario. So there's a reason that we did that deliberately. And I'd like to talk about that basically now, Brian. So if you can turn on the slide, the, the one thing that I think people uh, come up with. It, there's always snipers in the audience and they go, oh, they're bashing somebody else's training. Get off of that. We're not. We're not bashing anything. We've invented something that doesn't exist today and we're partnering with Milo to bring it to you. Okay. 
all of those other uh, agencies and, and companies that are building stuff, they're all well-meaning. It's just sometimes they're not cognitively focused. So we chose to be cognitively focused. What does that mean? Well, whenever money's applied to a situation, uh, uh, people try to increase fidelity and make things more fidelity filled and flashy. Brian talked about that earlier. And, and that reminds me of Jeff Goldblum's comment in Jurassic Park. Your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they never stopped to think if they should. And, and that's my best Goldblum, Brian. But I, I hear you, uh, the actors aren't trained actors. Uh, there's a bridge in one of your scenarios and we don't even have a bridge in my county. Your officer's left-handed and I'm right-handed. There's a palm tree in the scenario and our agency's in Alaska. I will tell you folks that are listening, those things don't matter in true cognitive training. We're building resilience-based cognitive flexibility. And each one of your officers, you're going to be the conduit. You're going to transfer it to them with decision science. And these scenarios are deep, and they'll force you to think. You may, you may never fire a shot, but I swear you'll be using your critical thinking skills the entire time. And we didn't just add more people to complicate things. We didn't add a jack-in-the-box moment to test your reflexes. We've devoted the time and the effort to create these challenging but solvable Hoberman scenarios, one after the other. Each has a lesson that you can pay forward on the street, whether in courts, corrections, or on the road. And, and we know it works because our process has been vetted and tested over and over again in the most extreme environments on the planet. So, so why would, why would we include about. all of that stuff? So Greg just went into detail about all these additional considerations and planning into the scenario that here's what you have available to you and here's where this is on the map and knowing where you are in time and space. Well, why would we include all that? Because that's actually what truly matters for cognitive training. Um, you know, <clears throat> there's... No, oh, excuse me. That's what really matters for cognitive training, right? And, and meaning if I'm not engaging my decision-making process during a scenario, then, then it's, it's not really cognitive training. I mean, I love going to the range and shooting, but that's not going to help me make a better decision. Um, it, it, I have to be able to make mistakes in a controlled environment and ask hard questions in the moment. Well, well how do we do that? Well, we have to simulate something close enough to what you're likely to experience. Um, you know, we, the first rule of any simulation is you can simulate anything, but you can't simulate everything. Meaning you don't, so don't even try. Uh, I don't have to create some specific event uh, that someone's going to see. I have to create a event that allows you to utilize all of the options you have available to you, all of the things you have available organically uh, in your agency, but all of the uh, the, the, the tacit knowledge uh, that I've learned throughout my career and through my life to apply to this uh, to this a specific situation. So including all of that and building that into an actual scenario is what increases your cognition, that increases your critical thinking ability. And with any type of simulation-based training, that's exactly what truly matters. Yeah. So, so I want to break it down. Let's look at the scenario for a minute, Brian, and let's look at it frozen. So the first thing is let's discuss what went into the scenarios. And I'll just hit on a couple of key points. And the more you want to know, get with Joe and Amanda at, at, at Milo and Brian at Arcadia, and we'll, we'll take you right through it. And there's a test drive you can do and see a great video about it. But let's talk about proxemic orientation. So Brian, in this, I overlaid crosses on each of the participants' slide. And the difference comes up that everybody's oriented the same, except this cat to the right. Slide, please. So what could that mean? Well, Officer Hobman's orientation is focused solely on the kid in the white shirt. The three that have been represented by the blue lines, well, they're all oriented towards Officer Hoberman. He's the one that's addressing them. And two out of the three are bracketing Hoberman. That means that you have your feet wide enough that you're owning them. And you'll notice White Shirt actually has his left foot orienting the other team, which means I can make the reasonable conclusion they're all together. Now, note that the subject on the far right is oriented on the group, not the officers. That's a key point. Further, the subject's foot orientation is worthy of note. So let's talk about feet. Slide. So if we want to change our proxemic orientation to kinesic orientation, we're now going to use the oldest uh, uh, visible system of attending to something in your environment slide. And, and from the left, we take a look at Hoberman, again, only indicating the subject in a white shirt. That's interesting to me. That's why I illustrated it in red. Why would the officer be interested in only one person when he's got four that he might have to attend to, five counting you as the responding officer? Now, we take a look at white shirt. He's indica indicating Hoberman and the group. We can see that clearly. And then we take a look at the two that are at the bench, and they're bracketing Hoberman in the group. Okay. So even at the lowest level, I know there's some connection here because it's the game between humans, human interaction. So 
Which one keeps popping hot on me, Brian? Subject on the right. Guess what? He's on the right side and his feet are bracketing the officer and you, the approaching officer. That's important to me. That's a second profound signal that I saw out of many that we give in the student guidebook, the instructor guidebook, and on, on the Hoberman series for you to pay attention to. So let's go for one more slide. Uh, uh, let's take a look at something as simple as a test that we built in. So we only had the day to work with the actors, and the actors were just fine for the cognitive role they're playing. Uh, and you're saying, oh, well, mine were stilted. Yeah, because we had to give them a range of response. Yes, no, maybe, I don't know, I want to go, am I free to leave? Brian, each of those take time to build into the scenario, right? So what we didn't tell them, Brian, is what to do with their arms. So we gave them a clear, concise command. All of the four people that are participating on the right, we told them to keep their hands neutral unless they were demonstrative. Now take a look at our player on the right. The subject's the only one out of the group that doesn't do it. He's touching his hands and sticking his hands in his pockets constantly. Now you're saying, well, what about Purple Girl? No, Purple Girl is responding to a question from Hoberman and she's saying, I think I'm sick, I feel the leap. And guess what her mind does with her hands? Her hands go to her stomach. Listen, Brian, those kinesic orientations added on layer for layer for the other observations in real time are gonna help you uh, uh, define what might be happening next. Let's look at another one. Uh, uh, slide, please. Let's look at some environmentals. Well, we also uh, uh, asked Officer Hoberman uh, to be natural. We gave him a role and a script and had him rehearse how he was going to contact the kids. And you notice he has a flashlight, which is an illumination device or a, a defensive impact tool. But you know what? What turned his flashlight into a weapon? His intent. When you're pointing at somebody and you're making a threatening gesture with a, a impact weapon, Brian, that changes the perspective of everything. And take a look at the vehicle. The vehicle appears to have been parked just so the group can listen to the radio. I see the windows down. I don't see any specific orientation to the tires or the headlights that would make me think they're about to flee, right? That's an important consideration. But Brian, I would say take a look at the police vehicle you just arrived in and take a look at Hoberman's car. Both of the headlights on both of the cars were oriented to illuminate the subjects. So intent manifests itself in different ways, and we've got to be paying attention or we're going to miss one of those cues. Slide, please. And so I take a look now from left to right, and I say, okay, it looks like they moved the picnic table because there's transfer evidence on the ground. And if you were going to move the picnic table and not use it as a flipping battering ram to take down a door or a ladder to climb up on that business, that's significant to me. And you know what I'm not seeing, Brian? I'm not seeing trash that's indicative that they were smoking dope or, or underage drinking or partying or any of those things. And you say, yeah, but look, I see graffiti in the background. But what are the artifacts and evidence that make the graffiti more than interesting? What, what helps me conclude or include something in a situation? And those artifacts and evidence, environmentals are hugely important slide. So let's take a look at the vehicle itself. If the vehicle isn't poised to flee, what about the engine? What about the exhaust? At, at, at nighttime and in, in, in the winter uh, or late fall, you can tell if a vehicle's running before you ever get there. You don't have to reach up and grab the exhaust. Or maybe you use your thermal to determine that the vehicle's been running or is still running before you pull up because you don't want to uh, uh, engage in a vehicle pursuit that might harm uh, your perspective or the strategic uh, goals of your, your agency. And you know what's more important about that? Everybody that's listening to this broadcast that ever spent time on the road as a copper knows exactly what your scout car or what the fleeing vehicle smells like after a protracted pursuit. Are any of those smells present? And guess what? We can't do all of those, but if there was smell from sulfur like a firework or something, Brian, it's worked into the instructor guide. So you're reading along with it and you can help your trainee understand that. Slide, please. So why? Because we want to have enough information that we don't uh, uh, overload you but we do increase your cognitive load and improve your sense making and problem solving in extremis. And one of the things we talk about in that guidebook and how we do this uh, training is a tactical freeze, a tack freeze, meaning literally almost like a ceasefire on, on, a, on a shooting range. Um, the person going through the scenario can call that, the instructor can go through that. And what it does is right there in the moment allows you to either you know rewind, restart the action, or have that discussion point. I can think through the situation with, with the veteran who has more of the answers, who has a better understanding, and they could guide me in there. And then as, as the, you know, the, this is the point where I can ask those hard questions and make make mistakes, right? And the 
the point of the strategic operational tactical dilemmas are, are to correct them in the moment right there. So now I'm a trainee, I'm someone going through this training, right? You're guiding me through. Now I see what the right answers were. Now I get that perspective. You gave me a class last week on, on how to do this, but but now I get to play it out and now I get to do that. And and you as as the instructor, you get to sit there and and verify and validate that that they're actually learning, uh, that they're using this properly. And then you can modify how their performance is going to uh, to make a more correct decision. So if I get to do that in a simulated environment, I'm going to do it on the road. If I build those file folders as experiences right here, I can immediately take that when I walk out the door for my next shift and I can implement it on the ground. So you have uh, uh, a near infinite amount of power in the scenario to change things by picking a spiral. So we'll just talk about three of those spirals, Brian, that are, that are sticking out for me. And folks, if you're listening, the first one is the scenario itself. Slide, please. So with the scenario spiral itself, let's... Uh, Take a look at number two. Hoberman's in the midst of giving a verbal warning. Uh, Hoberman notes what appears to be fresh graffiti on the dumpster. After patting down somebody for paint cans, he has to cover officer assist to film the graffiti. So you have to go over and actually take those steps. But guess what? That's fine. Probable cause standards been met. Those things are working. But then Hoberman goes the extra step, Brian, and says, hey, do me a favor, toss the vehicle, go over and search that vehicle. Well, you know, Hoberman may not search the vehicle without consent or a warrant or uh, uh, those actions then would be deemed uh, not within departmental standards. So, so you can see, I've given you three, there's many more in the playbook, Brian, where you can actually increase the complexity or decrease it. You can be a training officer, an FTO that's working with your brand new officer and change these spirals and then go out and act them out on the road that night and find a situation that fits this and have your trainee go through it. Slide, please. The, the, oh, we want you to use these new, newly minted skills so we can also change the props. And again, if you're a two-man agency or if you're a 2,000-man agency, you can uh, a person agency, you can change it by your prop spiral. Let's take a look at the prop spiral slide uh, uh, here. Uh, the six pack of pop on the table can change the beer. Now you have miners in possession. Uh, the graffiti can match a similar tattoo or design uh, design that's found on one of the participants. Well, maybe you have a malicious destruction of property. You know, uh, uh, now Hoberman, while he's uh, talking, points out to you a nine millimeter round and, and whether it's an expended or, or a full cartridge, right? Uh, maybe that changes uh, the trajectory of the scene. Now maybe we have a weapons violation. Were there any shots fired calls? Those type of things. So you see here, I've only given you 10. You have a whole bunch of things that you can change. And again, these can be question points for off-duty roll call or after you get out of the scenario. Or, hey, next time I want to see you come in and, and take it from this point of view. And you don't have to think uh, 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 so much through it as an instructor because we've taken the time to break it down to the questions and the concerns and the likely things that your trainee might say, whether it's an individual or a team. Slide, please. And then finally, the, the spiral I'll give you is a perspective spiral. Let's say that you are in an intermediate size agency. Slide, please. What you can do is you can change this Hoberman scenario, scenario to supervisor view. And now the supervisors review in the body cam of this encounter and they want to uh, uh, you know determine whether there were you know, shortcomings in training? Uh, was the evidence admissible based on a lack of probable cause or uh, inadmissible because of lack of probable cause or admissible because of sufficient probable cause? Uh, there's a number of people daytime filming the encounter. How does that change it? Because, you know, everything's going to be on film anyway, and you shouldn't be doing stuff that's wrong. Uh, what about an internal affairs view that, that now you bring the officer in because they made wrong choices and you show them the consequences of your actions? The idea, Brian, is you can choose to grab the Milo scenarios you already have and go through them and then intersperse them with these cool Hoberman scenarios. So now what you're doing is you're building that cognitive load as you're training for all of the other events that are in the, uh, the multiple uh, catalog of, of potential tools. Slide, please. So, so what of this, you know, kind of, we always ask, you know, what's in it for me? What do I, what do I get out of this? And we, we try to be as clear as we can when we built this uh, Hoberman series and the scenario of what we, what we think is important to put in there uh, because a lot of stuff that that's already done is you already have experts at, at your agency or institution or already really, really good at. So where we're falling short is some of the decision-making and how do we train for that? And how do I get better at understanding the situation I'm in? And so when used correctly, the, the Hoberman scenarios develop the knowledge, skills, attitudes, aptitudes, abilities that allow trained officers to make better, more informed decisions. Right? Their training reinforces good habits and safe, positive interactions and learn to establish a culture of understanding and de-escalation by viewing what right looks like and the consequences of wrong choices. 
Together, these objective analysis and artifacts and evidence-based evaluations of each scenario will allow you to improve the trainee's abilities to make timely, logical decisions to complex interactions. So what does that mean? Well, the Hoberman is a human interaction simulator. Hoberman goes beyond any marksmanship and firearms training. Uh, it's not a, a thing with a G, it's a think with a K. It's not a gamified range or simple use of force or firearms training simulator. It's a human interaction simulator. It's the area that the thing that we do every single day of our lives that we take for granted that we might not be as good at, right, as we think we are. Uh, we come in, just like we talked about in this, with different sort of cognition biases that, that don't allow us to see things clearly. So if I get better at seeing things clearly and sense making and problem solving, right, I'm going to, my training that I already have and all those great tools, those things with the G that you have, I'm going to get even better at using them. And throughout every Hoberman scenario, you, the instructor, can make adjustments to hone both individual and interdependent aspects of their student's judgment, situational awareness, and de-escalation skills, meaning it empowers you, your actual officers, your training officers, the people who should be vetting and validating, the people who should be approving the training, the people who, who should be certifying people. It allows you to actually do that in real time. And, and Hoberman scenarios allow officers to experience complex and nuanced scenarios that adapt in real time, responding to the officer's reactions, in which all of their de-escalation and force options are on the table. So, so it's a realistic scenario. Just like the real world, the scenarios are nuanced and complex, and each one have their own little uh, uh, important aspects to them. And the Hoberman scenarios follow our ethos at Arcadia Cognorati of ABCD, always be considering de-escalation. And the Hoberman scenarios allow opportunities for duty to intervene training. So now I'm in a video simulator and I sit there and go, you know what? I should probably say something to this officer. I think this person is going getting out of line. Maybe I should do this. Well, great. You as a training officer could say, okay, how would you do that? Are you telling me you're going to, you're going to, you're going to say that to your shift supervisor, uh, someone senior than you. Okay. Show me what would that conversation go like? Uh, what could you say? And then I can respond back to them with likely scenarios. What you're doing is building in that critical thinking right in there. You're giving that trainee file folders, experiences to draw from when they are in a situation. And your brain will go, yeah, I get it. Now when you're on the road, it says, oh, I've seen something like this before. Hey, I have a, a whole bunch of different options for this available. And the Hoberman scenarios are, are flexible, nonlinear, and highly adaptive, meaning that you can take different routes. Greg we talked about the different spirals that you can take. You can take that literally in the simulator and, and then also figuratively as a discussion point to have uh, with you. And then you get a better feel for, you know what, when we have morning roll call tomorrow, there's a, there's a few things I need to cover with everyone because I'm seeing common mistakes. And with ours, you know, we create better witnesses, better report writing, and better testimony because there was no chance for implicit bias formation is all of our training focuses on profiling an anomaly, not a person, right? And so that's going to create the better witness. That's going to create the better report and then subsequent testimony. And Hoberman allows you to interact with your personnel, no matter their level of experience or expertise, and compare their responses to the strategic, operational, or tactical goals of your agency or operation. Every tactical decision they make creates an operational certainty and a strategic unknown. So no matter the experience level, I could have the brand new person just out of the academy, the field training officer, and the chief could all be sitting in the room discussing how they would approach that problem. Now you get multiple perspectives, generational perspectives, you get multiple experiences to explain why and how you should make better decisions. And most importantly, the Hoberman allows you numerous opportunities to reinforce legal moral and ethical high-speed decision-making based on best practices using an artifact and evidence-based cognitive architecture, something I can testify to, something I can write in my report, something that's legal, moral, and ethical, and something that's going to help me out and ensure, give me the, the now I have the competence, so I'll have the confidence to make the right decision at the right time for the right reason. So, I appreciate everyone hopping on here and thank you for your attention. I know there are some issues with the chat. You can go ahead and throw any questions that you have in the Q&A and Greg and I are, are going to stay on here for as long as you'd like to answer any questions. Uh, you can also get a follow up with a link to this and anyone who registered and couldn't attend will also get a link. If you're interested in learning more, always reach out to me, right? Brian Marin, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn or Brian Marin at ArcadiaCognorati.com or you can reach out to your contacts at Milo as well. So Greg, I'm gonna go ahead and take this down and I'm gonna bring yep. uh, Joe uh, into the conversation as well. So he can come up here and answer any questions. And thanks everybody that tuned in. Uh, we understand it's probably your lunch hour and 
uh, that there are limitations that we had as well for understanding those and being patient with us. Sorry, let me try and find Joe if there's anything else you want to cover here. Yeah, I want to cover Hey, Look at my nice little display. I, I so believe in the Hoberman and the, the lack of the jack in the box. I want to make sure that I demonstrated that and everybody on the design team uh, has their own as well uh, on the Milo side. And thanks to that crew in Ann Arbor that uh, made all of this possible for us today. Okay. Well, I'm trying to pull Joe in here, but uh, I'm having a, having a hard time finding him uh, on here. If there's anything else you want to uh, uh, cover here. Yeah. And there's a great question that just came in. Do you have Milo uh, does, do you or Milo have specific scenarios around HBPRNA? And I'll start with that. And the answer is absolutely. The idea is the whole idea behind, behind Hoberman is going to allow you to choose from just Milo or Milo Arcadia. And when you choose the Milo cognitive and the Arcadia cognitive, then you can go down the Hoberman. And the other thing is that you can also do that, Brian, with in-person training to support it at your agency or in Ann Arbor at Milo uh, and web-based training, much the same as we're doing right now. Those are pretty cool options that you have. And uh, here's the thing. We have the first scenario loaded, but we're wondering how we get our hands on the manual. And that's from Rick Anderson. And Rick, the, the easiest answer is Brian was trying to get our, our buddy Joe on there. Uh, uh, Joe is the perfect source for that. All of that support material uh, is uh, between Joe and Amanda Williams back at Milo. They'll be able to send that directly to your agency uh, to make sure you're able to pick that up. Uh, and, and again, listen, I, I know, Brian, because I'm like that. I, I know that sometimes I got a new scenario and I didn't crack the code. And the reason is I didn't open up that guidebook and read through it and see and rehearse myself before I did it. Another question here, Brian, if I have a Milo system now, uh, can I get these scenarios? Joe, there's one for you. How about somebody that's already got a Milo system at their agency, big or small? How do they tap in to get the, uh, the home rooms? Yeah, absolutely. That's just a simple uh, scenario update, which we have put out all the time. We have probably up to 50 new scenarios in addition to our cut and run Hoberman. So there'll be a lot of new content that's available right now. And then each time a new one comes out, Joe, they'll have the option of not only uh, tuning into a webinar like this to introduce it when it comes to the Hoberman series, but that's the same way. They'll get some kind of message from Milo saying, hey, look what's next, right? They'll, they'll be able to uh, keep track of the new uh, scenarios that are coming out. Is that a correct uh, answer? Yeah, absolutely. And same with the guidebooks. The guidebooks are all available for download as well. Beautiful. Well, I don't see any other questions uh, popping up. Uh, again, if you have any other questions, want to get a hold of us, obviously you can reach out to us. Um, you know, on, on LinkedIn is a great place to find both myself and Greg and and Joe as well. Uh, and then you can shoot us a question from there and reach out to us via email, and we'd be more than happy to go through this. And I know some of the folks to the the, the training guide um, is um, is very comprehensive. So if we have questions about that, always reach out to that Milo rep, and we can hop on this and and, and answer any questions. I've got a question, Joe. I know you've been patiently sitting in the back and I apologize. The presenter view thing got a little uh, wonky there. Uh, is there anything that you had a question about or that you wanted to add that Brian and I might not have covered uh, uh, in detail? Uh, no, I think it was covered. I think it's just important to, to, for people to know that it's, it is already out there and available for current customers. And then that we're continuing to build and have more of these Overman scenarios going forward. Fantastic. Um, any upcoming trade show where we can see Milo in these scenarios? Um, that should be what the next one, I guess, big one is, uh, uh, Joe would be the IACP in, in uh, October or? Well, oh, we'll be at OTOA. In oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Yep, oh, 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 yeah, there you go. Uh, OTOA. Um, so, and, and you'll post that somewhere. The P, the folks can go to Milo Cognitive, right, Joe? Go right on the web uh, and, and see all the cool stuff that we're going to offer, the newsletters and podcasts and all that stuff. Yep. That's available. They just have to access that. And yep. there's a question there, Brian, from, from, uh, Gonzalo, uh, from yeah. south of the border there, Gonzalo uh, Sanocion, uh, Gonzalito, who runs a uh, executive protection uh, and security company. And he says, we have scenarios for executive protection or uh, you know, for futures for civilians? And the answer is absolutely. Uh, yep. One of the things that we're working on now, not only the, the second in the series of Hoberman, is a series uh, uh, with encounters at security gates, where people are in vehicles or on foot coming up to the security gate. Also, uh, some of them are going to be immediately transferable, Gonzalo, when uh, you're coming to, for example, a closed business or doing a security check, or you get an irate customer. All of those fall into the cognitive realm of how to de-escalate a situation, uh, keep the forward momentum going, and solve a problem without resorting to uh, 
uh, to violence or uh, something that's not, you know, legal, moral, and ethical. Over. Great right. questions, by the way. Yeah, good question. Well, I don't see any uh, any other uh, uh, popping up right now. So I, uh, you know, in in being respectful of everyone's time, uh, yeah. I, I don't know any 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 final comments, Greg or or Joe. Yeah, I'll, I'll throw one quick one. And Joe, thanks to you and Amanda and everybody at Milo for this great partnership. It's a strategic partnership that works and it's going to save lives. Uh, Brian, I would say to you that uh, our tagline uh, is is appropriate in any of these situations. Yeah, I, I guess I'll, I'll end on that. Joe, do you have anything to, to add or? Thank you for having us and thanks for doing such a great job. Oh, thank you. Well, I Thanks everyone for tuning in and again, taking some time out of your day to hop on a little bit, uh, learn a little bit more about what we're doing and, and how we do it. Uh, again, please reach out to us with any questions, you know, follow up to rewatch the, the webinar uh, with a link so you can send it to anyone who you might think is interested. And I guess as we usually end things is please don't forget that training changes behavior. So thanks everyone for tuning in.